I'm Dr. Elizabeth Satouris, and we are here at beautiful Lake Toya in Hokkaido for a symposium on the foundations of science. We are looking into the basic belief assumptions that underlie Western science in order to see how the paradigm shift is occurring in science nowadays, uh, with some people still in academia doing more traditional science, and many of us who have left academia and are outside of science developing new kinds of assumptions in order to do new theories and new research. So we have a group of us gathered here, uh, eight of us who are scientists and philosophers of science, to look at both old assumptions and new assumptions, or still traditional assumptions, and look into the ways they are changing with a view toward developing a global science that can include all of humanity and can try out different kinds of theories based on different kinds of assumptions. So this DVD is going to show you uh, parts of our conversation at this Hokkaido Symposium in July of 2008 uh, so that you can have some idea of what we're doing as you continue to hear more about the development of a global science. Thank you so much for watching this. We're going to get to how to build a new science, but today we're on our personal assumptions, okay? And I think it's very important for us to lay that groundwork and then figure out how do we make this into a credible science. Even when people ask some questions, their hidden assumptions are already implied. So questions are determined by the assumptions and answers that come out of this also are determined by assumptions. So assumption really gives a whole context. So it is very, very, very important that we become cognizant and aware of our hidden assumptions. And we hold many, many, many assumptions unknowingly, unconsciously. So when we talk about science or anything, we don't talk about nothing, we talk, talk about something. So you already you know, have an assumption that you know, the topics upon which, uh, of which you're talking exist. Mm -hmm. You could say that one is uh, deciding something is real not only on the basis of something fairly direct or even a measurement, but um, theoretical models come in as well. And, uh, because science is trying to unify, it's trying to produce, um, trying to find uh, models that have maximum explanatory power. What do I consider to be real? Uh, you know, uh, James Jean uh, defines science as an attempt at setting order the facts of experience. The question is, what kind of experience we are actually setting in order? And, but it, is, it come close to you know, my uh, own assumption that uh, whatever shows up in the field of my experience, I consider to exist. Therefore, uh, these shows up 
in the field of my experience, therefore, you know, these experience, uh, these exist. Also, when I had this, everybody had this kind of a cosmic spiritual experience that are not sensory accessible, somehow spiritually accessible, that's also part of my ex field of experience. They, were, they also exist. And uh, so that is my fundamental premise or assumption regarding uh, reality that shows up in my experience. And experience has a wide range from sensory all the way to spiritual, what you can call mystical. Mm, thank mm -hmm. you. Manjir. Um, I'm just making the observation, having heard a few of the comments, that um, there's the assumption that um, reality is um, what we perceive through our consciousness, or, or reality is consciousness itself. Because some people are talking about nothing can exist unless it's conceived of or imagined, which is kind of like, yeah, am I getting this right, or would people disagree with me that that's not what's been discussed? Because I'm hearing some people both, both. Yeah, that's what I I'm would, getting. My answer to I'm what you asked would be both that are these, true. These two different <laughs> things are emerging, uh, or two complementary, or two the same. You know, so uh, you know, the, I think it, it's quite interesting. Well, yeah. it, it's interesting because I'm, you know, as I said, it's like I'm, I'm sort of um, experience reality more as. Um, it's consciousness that creates reality. Um, yes. No the mainstream assumption is precisely that, uh, that uh, everything is, uh, is uh, explainable uh, in, within the physical, uh, within physical reality. Uh, so if we take consciousness, then uh, based on that assumption, consciousness uh, has to be explained as a kind of product of uh, physical processes. Uh, so the question of, uh, we can talk about uh, cosmic consciousness uh, as a whole, but um, that cosmic consciousness, uh, now we need to talk about the uh, multiple consciousnesses, mm -hmm. in a sense, uh, that, uh, that constitute the entire uh, cosmic uh, consciousness and even beyond the meta-cosmic, if you want to use that, the meta-cosmic uh, uh, consciousness. So, um, and we need to go to biology. I mean, from, from cosmology, we need to go now to, to, to go to the particular mm -hmm. uh, domain, which is in, in, in biology, how in order to understand life, mm -hmm. what life is, understand what consciousness is, we have to uh, now to um, define the different uh, attributes that uh, categorize each of these different um, aspects of consciousness or different uh, levels of, uh, of consciousness. I'm, I just want to raise that because I think um, so far we have been talking about uh, in, in, in a rather uh, general way. Um, I think one, uh, one of the failures of the science until the moment is that they put emotions outside. And uh, if we are thinking in a consciousness science, like uh, Joshua was telling yesterday, we, are in, we have to include love. That's very difficult for science, for academics, but I think that it's an in important ingredient to the new science, to including emotions. N and now we can work emotion beside the science because we have the tools. So there is an assumption uh, in science that you know, that which cannot be quantified does not exist, maybe. And uh, in our own way of thinking, maybe we can expand that uh, you know, uh, uh, definition into something more than just quantifiability or communicability. So just my thought. So quantitative science is higher on the hierarchy than the whole range of science. Mm -hmm. Quantitative is better than, it's more discriminating than qualitative. Uh, and, th and that's a very important differentiation, uh, and that's one of the reasons that Western science has been so powerful, 
is because it has been quantitative, which means it leads to engineering, which means it leads to the manufacture of things reliably, reproducibly, etc. So I'm glad you brought that point up. It's very important. That makes it limited as well. Oh, of course it does. Absolutely. It, it yes, I agree with you because uh, when, I, when I intend to say that I think the problem is not science, it's not technology, it's the use and the purpose that we do with this. Because uh, I think that um, for years, you know, science and rationalism to, to become the king and, and conduce the humanity, they put out the quality, okay? And I think that the, they have to be both. So um, I agree with uh, you know, the uh, quantitative versus qualitative. Well, it's both, and they're both beautifully complementing. And you know, whether things are processes or things, well, you know, it's useful to think of both, as Yasuhuki said. It depends on the, uh, and Mr. Shoji said also, it depends on the level um, to which you're looking at things. And so you can't do the holistic thinking when you have to abstract only what you currently can measure in something. And I do recognize that you want to be able to handle more and more variables in your quantifiability, but there is a question to me whether the goal should be to, to only move it all into quantification or whether we need the holistic uh, quality picture of things, and I think we will always need it and that it has to be seen as not a superiority of one over the other, not a goal of going entirely into the right or the left into quantifying or qualitative, but to truly be aware that any new science must have this complementarity, and that means the respect of the quantifiers for the qualifiers, right? Which is, this is absolutely critical because if they keep thinking that theirs is a superior one, eventually all that fuzzy stuff will come into our domain, it's not going to work right. What I understand through our conversation, Elizabeth, and why listening to others, why everyone's here, is to go beyond the individuality of our knowing and to, in coherence, to allow something greater than that to emerge. And so significant part of that is the connectedness. It's how um, when a group mind comes together, yeah. what happens is um, information comes through from the universe oh, that isn't within any individual here. Yeah. It's when the group comes together that magical emergence comes and we create something together that is bigger as a group than any of our individuals. That's what I was talking yeah, can about, I, can I not add, an explosion uh, of Can of I add to that? I, I meant, it, meant it in the following way, because I, I used okay. to have this kind of thing happen often with, with my consulting, where you could tune to the individual you're consulting with to the place where you're so paying attention that you're in tune and the bandwidths of your consciousness combine. And in the larger bandwidth, information can flow in mm, that you couldn't have saying. imagined. I think yeah. that's mm, what you're that's talking That's what I'm about. saying, and with a group. It mm -hmm. is that we should teach people yes. how to develop their intuition. Yes. Because in these multivariable problems, exactly. you really need to use that mm -hmm. skill. Right. It's a natural human yeah. skill. Okay. Good. Long as it's <laughs> in science. <laughs> yeah, I just really, really want to um, echo what um, Elizabeth is saying, and uh, uh, William uh, Bill, sorry, I keep calling you William, is uh, yeah, agreeing with as well. And and from my own experience, when um, I developed as a mystic, um, following my Kundalini experience over a number of years, um, and I also had the, my scientific life. Is that better? Oh, pull back a bit. All right. Uh, I also had my scientific life. Um, it all came together as a oneness. Um, when, and some of you have read the book Punk Science, so you know about my experience when I was actually in nature, and uh, I had, uh, I was actually thrown into the universe consciousness itself, 
and the universe consciousness came to me as a revelation, but not as someone of an indigenous culture might have experienced it. For me, it was particles. It was Hawking radiation. It was an understanding from that melted together completely my mystical and my academic nature as one. There was no separation. Um, well, I think uh, it's all very well to say science clearly includes intuition, but you st still have to make a big cultural change before uh, anything will happen and uh, before it becomes part of people's training, I guess. So it's just as difficult as our whole project. But we might think That's about gig. how one might go about it, what kind of courses there might be, and uh, clarify what the role of intuition is and what happens if you... The problems and challenges that we face in society are due to the fact that we lack imagination and creativity. People tend to memorize what is learned from others, and therefore, if you try to really find out a better answer, you need to do more than just memorize. In other words, each one of us has to think in our own way. Otherwise, the problems and the challenges would still remain in society. That's what I feel. Um, well, I just want to make a comment which uh, really would connect to a, a big subject, but... A, a big what? A big subject, mm -hmm. but um, it has been commented about the unconscious assumptions of science and that people don't know the assumptions that they're working on, but I, I think that's not the case. They have been spelt out, like science is based on experiments and public observation and so on, so that is not really the issue. The, deeper assumption is that that is the only valid approach to knowledge. And assumptions become dogmatic assumptions, but there, there's a distinctions. Surely all dogmas, all, all dogmas are assumptions, but not all assumptions are dogmas. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And there are assumptions that gave rise to those dogmas. Yes, mm -hmm. so give us an example. Uh, one of the fundamental assumptions that you know uh, science has is this reality is physical reality that uh, Manju talked about. Mm -hmm. That is uh, like a, more like a yes. fundamental philosophical assumption. That's what I call the non-living universe. Yeah, non-living universe. I'm fascinated by the fact that the concept of non-life mm -hmm. doesn't seem to exist in any other human cultures except mm -hmm. possibly was invented by the ancient Greeks when they invented the geometry of the spheres and so forth. Um, but, but it's so deep an assumption that you're considered virtually crazy mm -hmm. if you suggest that it's not a non-living universe. Mm -hmm. Now, every culture knows life and death mm -hmm. and recycling and things mm -hmm. like that. And often, scientists will interchangeably use dead universe and non-living. Mm, and true. dead is a completely inappropriate term because it implies it was once alive. Mm -hmm. It can't be dead if it mm -hmm. wasn't alive mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So that's a complete misuse mm -hmm. of the, of the non-life mm -hmm. concept. Some say the Earth is not living, but such people may actually be positioned in a non-living domain. In other words, if you think the Earth is living, then you would have contact with the Earth as an interaction between the other living things. If you treat the Earth as something not living, then that would already put yourself in an inorganic domain. So the Earth could be considered as living or non-living, depending on the way people approach it. It's completely different from a scientist's point of view. Mr. Shoji says something really, you know, he actually says very pro profound things, so, you know, matter-of-factly. You know, when he said that, uh, you know, um, when somebody sees something uh, non-living, there must be something within him or her that is dead. That's a very profound statement. And so changing the assumption from non-living universe to living universe has a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous significance. 
And you know, I'm sure we all know this, but it's really, really important. And so when you know, I have c came across lots of you know, cancer patients uh, because of my past association with them. And uh, when you go to doctors, they treat the body, they treat uh, people like just machine. So once we shift our thinking into seeing everything as alive, we have a tremendous impact. And just wanted to emphasize. And the reverse of what he said is true. So if you are dead, you see something to be dead. But once you begin to see things alive, then the deadness within them is going to be you know, revived. Yeah. Okay, completely changing direction. <laughs> um, new assumption. New assumption. New assumption is that um, the uh, characteristics that make an organism what it is is not reliant on uh, the uh, DNA sequence of uh, genes. And uh, that's uh, after the Human Genome Project. So that's a new assumption. I think somebody can put it better than that. Uh, you know, the, it, can, can you change your sentence uh, from a negative statement to positive statement? OK. Um, all right. Because it's come out of this, uh, yeah, help me out. How would you change that to a positive? Because uh, it's come out of the years of belief that um, uh, you know the DNA is primary uh, and essential dogma. So um, to change that now into a positive, how would we do that? Because you uh, we're saying that there's oh, there's there's something. Osman is going okay. to ask. Yeah, sorry. But you are actually responding. To, uh, to a certain assumption in, uh, in current uh, biology. Yes. Right. So what is the assumption that you are questioning? Yes, you're right. I'm, I'm making something that's been an assumption there, and I'm taking the scientific findings and then saying, what well, the yeah, oh, the original assumption. Yes, you're right. There is, a, there is something underlying that. The original assumption is that DNA is, is primary and responsible for all the characteristics of the organism. So. Um, if we change that around, we have to say that um, there is the new assumption is there is something other than DNA that is responsible for the characteristics of the organism. So the evolution of species is an intelligent learning process in nature. That's an assumption I make based on my perception of what happens. Okay, and it's very different from Darwin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's lots. There doesn't seem to be any <laughs> edginess about that one. Oh, yep. I have a question. Yes. So if you make that assumption mm -hmm. uh, in place of Darwinian assumption, mm -hmm. what are the possibilities that comes out of this uh, assumption, yeah. which was not yeah. available from Darwinian right. assumption? Um, well, there's already evidence for things that have been built on that mm -hmm. assumption. Mm -hmm. For instance, Barbara McClintock's work showed that DNA can intelligently rearrange itself under stress, mm -hmm. and so did Eshel Ben Jacob's work mm -hmm. in Israel. So there are quite a few experiments showing mm -hmm. that DNA literally rearranges itself to meet a particular stress problem. And, and John Cairns as well? John yeah, Cairns, Cairns has done it. Um, and then there's the, also the evidence that type 1 and type 3 ecosystems mm -hmm. have the first one largely competitive species and the second largely cooperative species. Mm -hmm. And I, I posit the theory mm -hmm. that there's a learning process that shows that feeding your enemy mm -hmm. is en more energy efficient than mm -hmm. killing them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and this, this would be a very important implication for society if this were understood in biology. So, and I, or it's, yeah, so the possibility that opens up from that assumption is tremendous. Yes. And I think when we choose assumptions, mm -hmm. that are wonderful you know, criteria to, to choose because some assumptions kind of close as a possibility, whereas this, this assumption actually opens up new possibilities. So are you talking about complementarity as a new emerging principle uh, in science, or uh, it, it, well, it's an old principle, but there's more interesting things like that now. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I know in, mm. ch in Chinese, and you know. Anyway, so, but so, is that like a 
emerging as a, a new um, assumption that you know complementarity is essential for the mm. for the process of the you know uh, phenomenon in the, in uh, the universe. No, I meant old in conventional science. Old in conventional yes, science. Yes, when quantum mechanics came up, it was. Uh, yeah, that's true. Right, right. That's uh, true. Yeah. Realized that the. Um, as Elizabeth said, uh, sometimes a wave, yeah, sometimes a particle, depending on how you look at it. Uh -huh. uh, I've, um, there's a lecture of mine you can see on the internet on how, um, uh, well, Bohr uh, argued that life might have to be viewed differently, which is uh, very relevant to our present discussion. So he was bludgeoned into giving up the idea. But I um, argue that it was a perfectly valid idea and is an important one. What was the perfectly valid idea that Bohr got talked out of? Complementarity of physics and biology, that uh, biology might um, uh, not be explicable according to ordinary quantum mechanics. And let me add, add that basically People have been arguing about that ever since the beginnings of quantum mechanics, and, and it is a very, very confused subject. Um, if you look at the writings, it just goes down through history, uh, and it, it's basically stated in a way which is very, very complex, because there are many features in it that are not simply a, a part of complementary nature. Would you agree, Brian? Uh, yes, I think the fact that biosystems are complex systems is uh, yeah. important as well. Yeah. Um, I think the issue of relationship between biology and physics is a very important issue. It is important now, and it's going to be more important in our new global science. Of course, we are looking for a more authentic, I say, more authentic relationship between biology and, and physics as we go for a new biology and new physics. So this our our new vision will bring about um, um, perhaps uh, the relationship between the two will become um, um, uh, uh, closer. You know, for me, it's beautiful what's happening at the moment with the, the so-called theories of everything. They're all actually showing similar patterns, and I think that's a beautiful point um, at, at this point in humanity, that everybody is seeing a new aspect of consciousness, a new aspect of the universe, and, uh, but they're seeing it through their own lens. But if we can put our egos aside and actually say that we all have a part of the picture... You know, that's the way to move forward. But um, when I use global, the way I meant it was what has been globalized is Western science. And so it's taught in Kuala Lumpur in the university and in China and all over the place. It has been adopted lock, stock, and barrel. And I want to make the distinction between a globally adopted Western science and a truly global science. Look at what I, we I want just to think it's with. important that we recognize that we're talking about two different things. The, the new science that we want to take to the world, the consciousness inclusive, this new science, and the concept of a global science where any culture can set basic beliefs on which to build hypotheses and be counted as science. If they do proper methodology and definitions and acknowledgement of axioms, the idea of opening it up that there's not a one true science or the one true science that actually says it is the only science at present. I need, we need to open that space so that the new science can be included in science without invalidating Western science. And also open it to, all, to ancient sciences, to the way young people will develop science. That's what I mean by global science, that and, opening. And can I get clear, is that the primary aim of this symposium yes. is to promote this idea of an all-inclusive science the, called, at the moment, a global science? That's, well, that's your it, primary it had, focus? It, the primary goal is to reassess the foundations of Western science 
so that we can see what it means to build a science, to flesh out what we mean by our new science, and to create a container for other people to do similar things in the world under the rubric of a global mm -hmm. science. Okay, so that's... that's so one of the common features I can, uh, I can detect amongst all those sciences is that it is an interpretive theory in the sense that David Bohm defines. Interpretive theory that has inner coherence. And coherence does not mean you know, logical in the sense of you know, Aristotelian logic as such. Uh, there can be many different forms of logic or coherence, but somehow uh, the theory has inner coherence. You mean an inner self-consistency? Self-consistency, yes, or inner integrity. So uh, one common feature, you know, uh, whether it is uh, Western science or Vedic science, or whatever the science we, we now we term science, they seems to have, it is a form of theory or theory in the sense of you know, uh, w the perspective from which to see. And it is an interpretive theory of phenomenon that has inner self-consistency. Well, by, by Western science's own definition of science, I think there are other sciences, and they don't. <laughs> By its own definition. I understand. I mean, science means knowledge, you know, possible. Well, it means ordering your knowledge in a particular way, mm -hmm. making explicit your foundations, <clears throat> creating theories, hypotheses, mm -hmm. doing research, getting answers, yes, yes. interpreting yes. them, repeating them, yes. you know, all of those things. Um, if we go along with definition of global science as presented by Elizabeth, uh, then um, that takes care of the concern that you have raised, precisely because um, we, the, the global science here uh, includes the, uh, the ancient sciences and other uh, traditional sciences. And uh, I, in particular, would like to refer to a living culture one living culture, which is my own living culture, tradition, Islam, uh, in which precisely, I mean, the, we use the word science uh, to refer to an um, systematic, organized body of knowledge with uh, which uh, well-defined uh, 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 subject matter with, um, of course, uh, any science must have its own assumptions. It has own uh, uh, methodological, uh, its own methodology and um, uh, goals that it seeks to, uh, to, to achieve. All those uh, define what science is. Mm -hmm. And in the, uh, in the history of Western science, uh, uh, you have that uh, narrow definition, I think, um, uh, that started with uh, the British um, philosopher William uh, Wool when, when he gives a very, when he f began to dis define science in terms of method. Uh, in other words, th there is only one method uh, which um, uh, is, um, uh, which is, I mean, uh, by which we should define science. If a science, um, uh, scientific, if truths and uh, realities cannot be ascertained, cannot be verified according to that method, then it, it doesn't qualify to be science. That's how there was a once, there was a point in the, um, uh, the history of modern Western thought when psychology was considered as a pseudo science, not as a real science. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, not yet. Not yet. Right. Okay, almost now. <laughs> so yeah, in, 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 in other words, we have uh, different historical experiences with that, but uh, I think the beautiful thing when uh, the uh, Elizabeth's definition is that uh, by including the other non-Western sciences, whether ancient that has, have, that has already died out, but still others we still are very much alive until today. Uh, I don't know when exactly but uh, I think in the history of the Western science, it, uh, in, in a moment, it becomes a colonialist science. And we are uh, now we are in post-colonialist times of the humanity. So uh, there is a word that comes to me and comes to me, that is uh, dialogue 
is why we need the science that could dialogue now horizontally and uh, reciprocally with the other science. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, it, the, what I'm saying is based on facts. What are the facts? The I facts are uh, we know they exist. Uh, uh, many traditions, many cultures, uh, which have uh, different visions of reality, not looking as pure as a machine, uh, but as, as something else, and they also have a practical if, uh, implication, effect on their culture, on society. Uh, I think this is a very important thing. Why we, why we insist on this uh, new global science, because uh, it can have a very uh, the kind of vision of reality that we have will influence the kind of culture, will influence the kind of culture that we have. So, so many cultures are now, are now starting to decay because they are forced to live uh, with just this vision of modern science. Uh, you know, I think it, it is the important thing. Yeah. And the last one, science has a strategic nature because it provides us with models and representation of reality that will guide our perceptions and our way of doing things in and about the reality. So in post-colonial times, such as the present of humanity, must be inclusive and cover the concurrence of multiple skills and all cultural responses to the regulation of individual and social life. I love that uh, finish to the fore because it's making science very human and it's saying that our models determine how people think in different cultures around the world and it determines their behavior. It creates their reality because science is telling their creation story and our relationship to each other and to the universe and you've included all of nature, uh, so that's a wonderful finish to it. Uh, I'm Brian Josephson, I'm from Cambridge University where I'm an emeritus professor in the physics department. Uh, our group was um, formed as a collection of people who believe that present science is too restrictive and we could benefit by um, uh, expanding what is done, uh, our scientific process. Um, our slogan is really that communal agreement is something that's more important than any fixed methods. And uh, the me methodology, as in any scientific discipline, is um, developing a shared language within which one can explore, do things, achieve results. And so many different communities will develop their own science. And then these communities can communicate their conclusions to um, the world as a whole that can either accept or reject them. So um, this will incorporate uh, traditional forms of knowledge and new forms of knowledge and uh, hopefully this will be of great benefit to mankind. Hello, I'm Bill Tiller. I'm an emeritus professor from Stanford University. I'm a physicist working in the area of materials and I see global sciencing as a natural expansion of traditional science to include the effects of human consciousness on physical reality. I also see that this kind of expansion will lead to many new scientific discoveries and many new technological inventions that will benefit humanity and the world in general. I also see that it will produce much greater appreciation of indigenous cultures around the world, both present and ancient, and these are the folks who have naturally been in communion with nature with their consciousness. Hello, my name is Dr. Mangia Samantha Lawton. I come from England and I'm a medical GP and holistic practitioner turned writer and lecturer. I believe that we're actually at a point of emergence of a new science 
And this is a science that actually says that consciousness is fundamental to reality. And we're going forward and reconnecting to the uh, sense of the sacred in the multidimensional that's in indigenous cultures throughout the world and throughout history. And what's so exciting is that through the very method of reductionist, mechanistic, uh, rational science, we've come back to the ancient wisdom again, that the universe is living, breathing, and alive and awake, and that it consists of love. I'm Enoe Texier from Venezuela. I'm an anthropologist and doctor in social sciences. And global science for me is a process of constructing a new knowledge that gives answers of the demands of the humanity in a present critical time of our history. A, a kind of knowledge than respect all the skills of the different cultures that actually live in the Mother Earth in order to seek a new way of modeling our societies that could uh, make the world going on uh, in a better way for, for the new generation of the world. My name is Akio Shoji, and I'm the managing director of a company called Aleph, which owns a chain of restaurants. We have 300 restaurants covering an area from Hokkaido all the way to Okinawa. We have 700 full-time employees and 7,000 part-timers. I'm the founder of the business, which considers agricultural environment and business management together. Let me talk about my concepts with regard to global science. The path we take is not just in one direction. It's just like the radius extending from the center of a circle, multidirectional in 360 degrees. There are infinite directions that we can take. At the same time, we are also being looked at from all the different aspects of our 360 degree surroundings. According to a proverb of the indigenous Japanese people, the Ainu, everything that comes from heaven has a role and a meaning. Everything has a meaning. This viewpoint is important. It's not just something that has been completed by scientists. The process is very important as well. With children's education too, Instead of just the completed product created by famous scientists, there's nothing stimulating or encouraging such as seeing the effort being put into the unfinished article. It's not the finished product, but the current process itself that I feel is important. My name is Yasuhiko Genku Kimura. I'm a Buddhist priest scholar and philosopher of science. I was born in Japan and now reside in New York uh, City. Albert Einstein said, through science, he wanted to know the mind of God. But the heart of God is more primary than the mind of God. The heart of God is a matrix of mystery from which the mind of God as the matrix of meaning and truth arise. Global sciencing, the scientific approach that we are developing, seamlessly unite heart and mind and achieves ever greater knowledge and wholeness of life. My name is Osman Bakker. I'm an emeritus uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur and also the deputy uh, CEO of the International Institute of Islamic uh, Studies. I believe uh, that uh, 21st century humanity is in need of a new science. This new science should have uh, seven features. First, 
it should be, uh, it is global in the sense that it is sympathetic to all the sciences, the sciences of all the uh, cultures of the world. Uh, second, it is holistic in the sense that it takes into account all aspects of reality, uh, both uh, objective and uh, subjective. Third, it is integrative in the sense that it is uh, not the knowledge of the parts is always integrated into knowledge of the whole. It is, uh, number four, it is additional in the sense that it embraces the wisdom of the past. Fifth, it is contemporary in the sense that it is applicable to new physical and human conditions. Sixth, it is pluralistic in the sense that uh, in, in its methodology takes into account not only the scientific method of Western science but the, of the approaches of non-Western science. Seven, it is human in the sense that uh, in its technological applications it takes the interest of all humanity. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Satouris. I'm an evolution biologist and I live in Spain. Global sciencing to me would permit different cultural sciences and self-organized groups of scientists to expound their set of scientific foundational assumptions, the theories that they build upon those assumptions and the hypotheses to be tested and then carry out their research and promulgate the results within a global forum of institutions and journals and other media. And the overall purpose of this globalized uh, sciencing would be to collectively enhance human and other life of Earth toward well-being for all. <laughs>